Uh, thanks everyone for for joining. Um, really good to to have a couple new faces here. Uh, we even have Zach here. Looks like he just popped in. Um, yeah, I think we're just gonna get started. Like I know we're you know in a uh, interesting time here. So thank you guys for for joining One Million Cups. Uh, really appreciate seeing some some familiar faces and some new faces. Um, I'm gonna share my screen, but uh, this is an awesome time to uh, still just connect with people. I think this is the one of the times where it's like, what do we do inside our homes for <laughs> all this time? Um, so if you haven't already, get yourself some coffee, um, download the app and check in. It's a really good way to uh, get, you know, stay connected with the community, stay connected with what's happening. Uh, follow us on social media as well at 1MC Seattle if you haven't already. And join the conversation on Meetup uh, or just mark your calendars every Wednesday <laughs> at 9 a.m. here. Um, and what are we about? I think most of us are somewhat familiar with this already. So we're here to share ideas, to offer help, to ask for help, to build community and to support each other. This was one of the best, like one of the like reasons, main reasons for why I'm part of this community and ended up organizing or being a volunteer organizer as well is because it's a very like, right when I walked in, it was super open, real vulnerable conversations with other entrepreneurs. And this was in my beginning stages too, where I was like, I don't know what I'm doing. And then everybody else was like, yeah, we don't really either, but we're all figuring it out. So um, we're here to really support each other and be uh, um, super open with how to ask for help and how to offer for help. So what are what makes us different than other networking communities? Um, this is this is for presentations, not pitches, right? So we're here to you know, present a new idea, present our business for some of them for the very first time, um, and we're here to connect, not just network, right? So um, we're here for the community, not uh, by the community, and we're radically and intentionally inclusive. Um, the 1MC Nation has over 168 communities around the country with 3,500 uh, attendees and 700 plus volunteers. Um, it's constantly growing and super cool that this is a nationwide thing that, you know, across the country uh, right now that this is happening. Um, and we're here to educate, inspire, and connect entrepreneurs. Special thank you to our community sponsors, Seattle Strong and The Small Studio. Um, they help make this keep going. And our volunteers, uh, for, for those, uh, some of us on the call right now. So what can we expect today? Coffee and conversation and uh, six minutes of a presentation from our entrepreneur um, and 20 minute Q and A uh, for, to, to ask your questions for the entrepreneur and uh, to really bounce back any feedback or um, questions that help might make, move their business forward. Um, and during that Q and A, uh, because of this Zoom here, uh, you could raise your hand to ask a question. So if you click see on the bottom, you'll see participants uh, icon and you'll see a raise hand button. Uh, if you do have a question, you can just raise your hand and we will call upon you to, uh, to unmute yourself. So with that, please welcome Jyoti from Spiel. Clap and clap, clap. <laughs> uh, I'll make sure you have presentation rights here. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for having me to 
present to your community in, in advance for all the amazing advice I'm expecting to get from you. Hope that you're peaceful and grounded wherever you are through the intensity of the last few weeks. And so let me go ahead and share my screen with you so you can see what I'm looking at. Stand by. Okay. Okay, so give me a second. I'm just going to shrink this down a little bit. Okay, please confirm for me that you can see what I'm looking at. Excellent. Okay, so my name is Jyoti Patel and my firm is Spill LLC. And I work with technical CEOs and VPs who are ready to disrupt their teams so they can implement better ideas. So I help technical CEOs and VPs mobilize teams who are stuck in reactionary short-term thinking to promote creativity, optimize their behaviors, and better make decisions through periods of rapid growth and transitions. So here's my mission, my company mission. So Spill, we deliver programs that help our clients spark creativity, gain strategic clarity through growth and transitions. So I do this in three main ways. I help my clients expand their creative capacity and develop resilience. And this is very much an individual and sometimes at a team level. I help my clients promote trust, candor, and a, th a thriving organizational culture. And finally, I help my clients mobilize their teammates around an adaptive vision and strategy. So in a nutshell, I help clients promote healthier cultures, who they are, how they communicate, their norms and their guiding behaviors in place that help them perform better. And I help them with their strategy, which is where they're going. Do their roles, goals, processes align with where they're really going long term? So let's explore the problem a little bit, shall we? So to explain the problem, I'd like to share a little bit with you about my own story. So my own professional career path and journey started in 2005 when I got hired into the Boeing company as a flight test engineer out of, um, out of school, fresh out of school. And on paper, this was my dream job. Like I got to Boeing and I was, I was working in flight test and in a, in a job where I got to interact with an airplane every day. That was my, that was my job. And so on paper, it was the coolest job ever, but the reality of the situation when I got to Boeing was vastly different from what I imagined it would be like. And it was just pretty depressing to see the reality. Folks around me, despite having what I thought was one of the coolest jobs on the planet, were super disengaged. Folks were not empowered to contribute to decision making. They were not motivated to improve things. They were very much committed to maintaining the status quo. Um, as far as alignment, you know, we heard a lot about strategic direction from very senior leaders and VPs, but as far as how our jobs at the working level lined up to the strategic direction of the organization, there were no conversations happen happening around that. And there was very much a huge disconnect between the work that we were doing and where we were going big picture as an organization. In terms of communication, there was an avoidance of conflict, very much so. People would shy away from uncomfortable conversations. And when it came to inconvenient truths or challenging leadership or engaging in conversations that made us uncomfortable, Folks, even leaders at, at high levels, 
shied away from conflict. And I thought that was a huge problem. And then finally, creativity, you know, when it comes to folks thinking creatively and using their skills and their strengths to really contribute and make an impact to the organization. I didn't see that happening either. And so this is when I realized early in my career that I was not just passionate about being an engineer and being a technical person, I was passionate about organizational behavior. And so I went back to school in 2008 to get my master's in org design. And at Boeing in the years that followed from 2008 to 2018, over the course of 10 years, I worked on um, about a dozen different organizational transformation projects, all the way from a huge consolidation of an organization of 6,000 people, all the way down to a transformation uh, of a team of 10 people that I was managing. I had an interesting role at Boeing, like I had kind of what I call a parallel career path where I was an engineer and then I went up into management and I had my day job. But on the side, I was very much involved in facilitating executive offsite retreats, in strategic planning exercises, in being a conduit between senior leadership and working level employees to really start solving those very same problems that, that you see here on the screen. And uh, I had an amazing career over the years there and um, was able to really move the needle on some huge initiatives. And, um, in 2018 is when I decided to leave it, to pursue my own personal dream of just doing this work on my own and helping teams outside of the Boeing ecosystem. And so in 2018, I launched my practice spill and I launched it under the umbrella of creativity because I believe that when it comes to culture, when it comes to strategy, that creativity is the container that can really engage, excite, to make the planning and culture development process so much more fun and inclusive. And so this is how I am now packaging the transformation work that I've done uh, for my clients in the Pacific Northwest. So some of the things I've been able to do with teams, I'll let you just read these statistics on your own. I'm not going to read them for you, but um, these numbers include work I've done at Boeing as well as work that I've done since leaving Boeing with other clients. But I'm very much a systems thinker and focus on helping my clients on a range of issues and solving issues all the way at the individual level to the systems level. And that's really what my superpower is, is I not only understand culture and behavior and transformation, but I understand organizations and management and what it's like to lead teams and manage budgets and manage projects and process and performance to plan. And so I pull all of those strengths together into a program that I now deliver to my clients. So my business model is very much a monthly program. And the way that it works is I lead my clients through an engagement that typically lasts about four to six months. And it fo follows a design thinking approach where I start out with a diagnosis, an inclusive diagnosis with my clients and their teams, where we just get all of the key players together in a room, previously in a physical room, now pivoting to a virtual room and exploring what that looks like. Um, but there's a process that I follow from a diagnosis, um, collecting qualitative and quantitative data and really understanding where the issues and blocks are all the way from culture to strategy. I deliver training in creative and playful workshops in communication, conflict management, creative thinking, design thinking, among others. But the training is very much focused on addressing the problems that come up through the assessment. Um, I work with my clients on coaching. So I am also a coach. And I find that coaching is the, one of the most powerful methods to really overcome some creative blocks. You know, I've worked with so many teams. And one of the things I've learned is that you can do all of the amazing work at the team and organizational level. But if you're not helping individuals overcome their own blocks, their own fears of judgment, their own fears of fears of failure, whatever those blocks are that prevent them from engaging in conflict, that 
promote them to avoid discomfort and to avoid those things. I help individuals overcome those things one-on-one -on -one so that the, the impact of my engagement goes up. And I found great power in weaving in coaching into my programs. And then finally, I work with my clients on developing a, a really solid strategic plan. And often they already have a strategic plan, but the, the strategic process is very much focused around making the strategic plan understandable, accessible, instead of it being a bazillion words on a page, really honing it into a few core concepts that all of the folks in the organization understand and can align around and could tell you if you if you ask somebody on the you know on the floor in their office like what are your three biggest strategic priorities every person in the organization should be able to tell you that and if they do, if they can't that's a problem so i work with teams on developing strategies that are accessible um, that are emotionally charged um, and connect them to a vision um, and a picture of the future that is really relatable and then um, depending on the client, I do work on translating that strategy down into tactics, into roles and processes and roadmaps that align with, okay, now we know where we're going, how are we gonna get there? And so this is kind of the template for my program, but it is customizable depending on the client's specific challenges and needs. So that's, a really quick summary of who I am and the work that I do. Um, here's my contact information. And I would love to hear your feedback. So I'd like to open up for questions right now. Let me know what you think. That's really cool. Um, hey, I'm Greg. Uh, so hey, Greg. Can you tell me a little bit about how? So you, I think you, you did a, I feel like I have a pretty good understanding of what it is that you help people to do. I'm curious as to how, you, and you kind of, and you went through like the very top level of the different um, sort of the process, mm -hmm. but like what does, what, what does it look like, like at a practical level when we're engaging in this sort of um, facilitation by you? Like what, what is an example of kind of, yeah. Well, let me give you an example of a client that I worked with last year. And so I worked with this client and um, we worked together over the course of five months. And it started out with me working with the two directors of the organization. And um, they came to me with very specific problems. They were like, we're having trouble um, navigating different leadership styles. Everybody was very nice to each other. They're like, we really love each other. We're like a family, but we're not challenging each other. Except there are a couple of really strong personalities that challenge everybody else, but then nobody else challenges them back. And so there's this lopsided participation thing. And um, they had troubles with the strategic piece as well as conflict. So what I did is the very first step was um, after getting a clear problem statement with the directors, I facilitated a discovery workshop. And this is one of the key first steps in the engagement is facilitating an experience that is both data rich. And so we get in a room, um, it, we use a lot of sticky notes. I create a template based off of their organizational operating model and structure. And we gather data, we gather stories, we gather any existing data that exists. And we just get it all up on the wall. And I find that this very first critical step of getting folks in a room and lifting people up out of their daily grind, out of their daily hamster wheel of whatever's happening this week, next week, tomorrow, and really thinking about their organization as a whole, as a whole organization and as, as well as long term. Like, instead of thinking about the organization right now today, like, let's think about this organization for the next five years. And so this very first step of like facilitating everybody in an assessment where they all understand that their contribution matters and they all understand how important the big picture is and how their part, their work, their contribution 
fits into the bigger picture is a really key first step. And so through that process, we together identify the biggest problems and opportunities and issues. And, you know, if there are any design thinking folks in the room, like, you know, to be able to define the problem together is so important because understanding the problem is really a good chunk of the work. And so, so that's the first step, you know, and, and through that, I, um, I switch hats to a consultative role and I, I pull that data together into a report. So for this particular client, in addition to that workshop, I, I um, delivered a survey to all of the employees in the organization. And then I pulled everything together in a report and I mirrored it back to them. I said, okay, based off of what you're telling me, here's what I see, here's what I'm finding, here's what I'm seeing. And based off of that, here's what I'm recommending. So then I make recommendations back to them. And I did that with this client. And they're like, okay, you see us, you hear us, you understand us. These recommendations, and they didn't hear anything brand new, but they're able to see these recommendations. Like, it's like the cream that rises to the top of, a, um, of the butter, you know, like they get to see the forest for the trees. And so then after that, I engaged with this particular team around, okay, now that we know what we need to work on, what we need to improve, let's start weaving that into your different roles. And so the recommendations were very much focused around realigning roles around the opportunities in the organization. So we did some restructuring with their org chart and cleaning up some really key areas where, the, where work was flowing through the organization and optimized how work was flowing through the organization. Um, so that was one thing. I facilitated a workshop with them on communication and conflict management because that was a really big problem for that for them. Um, and that was great. Like they picked up tools to really help them move into conflict and reimagine conflict as something generative rather than destructive. And that's a really key belief that's so common. Um, I also coached five key members of their staff over the course of a few months and learned things through these one-on-one -on -one coaching sessions that were just really profound dynamics that existed within individuals that manifested within the larger system. I was able to unblock those things with these five members and, um, and they could see, they could see how the things they raised with me in a one-on-one -on -one environment, I was able to maintain the confidentiality and that's key in terms of being a coach and a consultant. But yeah, it all fit together. And then finally, I moved them into like a strategic planning process where we, they had a pretty robust strategic plan already. So we focused on visioning. Um, but I use Lego Serious Play as one of my tools. I use playful methods a lot. And so I facilitated a shared vision workshop with them where we actually built a model of their future organizational model using, using bricks. And um, I can't really communicate to you the power of this method just electronically this way. Um, but it was really cool. It was really cool to get folks telling the narrative, telling the story of what their future looks like, rather than it just being words on a page and helping their team tell that story and to understand what that story was. So that's like, it's a really intense engagement. It's hard to describe in just a few minutes. Um, but that kind of gives you a taste of the different pieces and how there's this cultural component as well as the strategic component and the individual component as well as the organizational component. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, um, that's, that's, that's really cool. I mean, I'm thinking about like uh, how you're solving for sort of alienation just creatively and like an, I don't know, I just feel like when people are lacking that feeling of alienation, then there be there. I mean, there's probably a transition in terms of how like the overall um, just morale of the place. I, I don't know. It's really cool. I love your process. Thank you. We can uh, have another question going. Looks like Adam raised your hand here. Go ahead and unmute yourself. There we go. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Good morning, Adam. Okay. Good morning. Um, I apologize for the hair today. Um, <laughs> hey, I'm, uh, I'm curious, and apologies if I missed it. Um, you're, 
your services definitely sound like a, a much needed service, um, but it seems like it's one of those services that is uh, very broad and applicable to the global market. So who, who do you think is your target audience? And I'm curious that also, second question to that is, how do you think you're gonna reach them given all that's going on today? Oh, what a great question. So I will say like, so I've, I started my business in October, 2018. And the very hardest thing that I've had to do, aside from like overcoming my own, my own fears, <laughs> so perhaps the second hardest thing I've had to do is, is identify my target client and to really narrow my focus enough to say, here's who I want to help because it's very much been iterative and I didn't feel like I had enough context in the early days to understand who I could help. I finally feel like I'm starting to get clear on who that is. And it's, if you remember, like when I started my presentation, I said CEOs and technical VPs. And, and so my target clients are technical executives. And the reason for that is as an engineer, like coming from an engineering background and having knowledge of processes and how, um, programs are managed having that lens as well as the organizational behavior lens very much puts me squarely in this space where i can relate to technical leaders to technical workforces with it with this cultural language with the organizational behavior language i also based like i'm a generalist and that's been something that i've struggled with i have a really wide range of skills and it's been a challenge for me to, to narrow my, my offerings and narrow them and articulate them in a concise way to folks when my skills are so broad. And so admittedly, it's something that I have struggled with and I still struggle with is to just explain like how I can help somebody because it depends, like it depends on who you are. And I am capable of customizing my, my like my skills based on what folks need but yeah technical vp ceos i want i want to work at the strategic big picture organizational perspective and so i'm also targeting companies that are earlier on in their journey or they're um they want to grow so i'm looking at like tech companies um in, around the series a um you know, funding level, maybe like one to 200 employees. And, um, but they're getting ready to transition. They're either going through some kind of merger, they have aggressive growth goals, they're, um, they've brought on a new executive or they have a new teammate and they wanna get kind of clarity and tighten up their, their strategy through this period of transition. And it's taken me a long time to even just land on that, so. I'm pretty proud of myself for that. Um, and then what was your second question? Will you remind me, please? What was your second question, Adam? Sure thing. Sure thing. So how do you plan on approaching those B2B, Series A, SaaS, tech CEOs, and VPs of um, tech now <laughs> that we're all going through this? Yeah, it's such a great question. So it's hard enough to reach them before, but now these folks, so in tech, it's one of like, it's, it's, it's an industry that's still going, right? And so despite the, the economic collapse that's taking place right now, tech is relatively um, insulated compared to other industries right now. So these folks are busy. They are on WebExes or Zooms all day and they may or may not have kids or have give kids at home or just are stressed out. I don't know that right now they have the capacity to even think about hiring a consultant. And so what I've been doing is just offering um, different ways to engage with me that more support them as leaders and developing that resilience piece because um, I, I just don't really think that there's space super short term to do that but i i'm so open to feedback here and this perhaps is something that you could all help me with um i'm hosting a weekly uh leadership call on thursdays right now that i'm using to uh, reach out to my existing network and to also funnel 
potential leads and potential clients into, into this weekly leadership call on Thursdays. And I'm rolling out some virtual offerings this week and in the next two weeks, just to really address some of the short-term problems that I think my clients are facing. Um, like I have, for example, this Friday, I'm facilitating a 30-minute, a really quick 30-minute call with a, with a collaborator on three energizers and playful exercises you can use during remote meetings just to get people showing up, engaged, present in the moment. Um, so I'm really focusing on helping my potential clients just address their short-term problems for now and building relationships, continuing to build relationships. But I, uh, um, that's as far as I've kind of thought about and uh, I'm interested to hear if any of you have got some better ideas or, or thoughts around that. I mean, I'll just chime in. I, I found that for right now, I think your thesis about everybody being busy and stressed out for this market is really spot on. And I think that I love your idea of how you're presenting yourself with just this free, um, just, hey, come hang out with me. We'll just have an open-ended discussion mm -hmm. uh, because I think I think people who are creative and finding ways to show that they can be helpful and not necessarily always make that help be billable are going to continue to find uh, the opportunity. So I applaud you for that. I think that's a real creative way to do that. Thank you. Awesome. Looks like uh, Eric Eric Zuckerman is next. Hi Jody, it's nice to have heard your presentation. Uh, you. I have a friend who I have a friend who does similar work uh, on the East Coast, and uh, when I was visiting him last summer, he handed me a little brochure which you could go through and kind of work through to see um, and bring up from your own answers to some certain questions, your own understanding that you might need some assistance with your organization. I said to him, you know well, let's get this online. You should get this online and use it that way to draw in some people. And as you were speaking, I just kept thinking about that same thing that is there something you could give to a, to a CEO or to an executive at a company that they could then either fill out themselves or even send out as a survey, at the, mm -hmm. especially during this time when their people are not necessarily always busy with work mm -hmm. and find out you know, is there something we're not even aware of? Is there an issue we need to find? Is, is there a way to elucidate that information right now uh, that might lead to customers in the future when things get back to normal or, or what the new normal will be? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a brilliant point. And it's something that's been on my, on my list for a while. I, I do have a survey that I use with my clients. Um, it's a post engagement survey right now, but it's, it, it's basically designed to show the various areas that I, I help around. Um, and I have thought, I, I, I want to turn that into an assessment like you spoke about. And I think the balance for me is like, and this is actually a really interesting point that maybe some more of you have some ideas on, but there's a lot of assessments already out there, right? And so as an entrepreneur, how much do I want to reinvent the wheel, rebrand the wheel under my own umbrella so that it's my own IP and come up with something on my own versus leverage things that already exist that others own. And so there are so many assessments out there that are useful and excellent and people with a lot more knowledge than me have, have designed those with, with expertise. And so I am pretty clued in to some existing assessments, whether it's from a leadership or a culture or a strategic alignment perspective um, that are handy, but they don't necessarily represent the full breadth of how I pull those pieces together in my program. Um, so it's, it's something that I think would be valuable. I just haven't invested the time or prioritized it until now. I mean, yeah, and I'm, I'm curious to think about kind of how that fits into all of the other stuff I'm doing, because I got two kids at home too, and um, <laughs> all the things, none of the time. So, but I love the idea. Great. 
Cool. Um, Sheila was next. Hi. Hello. Hello. Hi, Sheila. <laughs> uh, hi. Uh, it's great seeing what you do, and um, I love your emphasis on creativity. I have a similar um, uh, uh, consistent belief. <laughs> it's not the strongest word, but um, anyway, I'm wondering how you measure. You mentioned that you uh, increase creativity by 25% on your list. Mm -hmm. I just kind of picked that out. Mm -hmm. um, like, how do you position creativity and how do you actually measure? Yeah. And, um, just to stack another question on there. <laughs> um, yeah. Often people think creativity is like a nice to have or a frill. How do you uh, position it so that it's really um, core? Oh, that's a great question. I'm so glad you asked it. So, well, to first off, answer your, answer your questions on where my numbers came from. Those were, those were part of an assessment where folks that I have led through workshops have said, just self-assessed, like how creative were you at the beginning? And we took a baseline. And then how creative do you feel at the end? And so that's where those numbers came from for the statistics. And, as far as how I position creativity, you know, it's really interesting. And I think that ugh, we could talk for a long time about this, but creativity as a concept is really like, it's really hot right now. And I don't know that it's really well understood widely in terms of what it actually means. And so there's a few different threads to how I'm positioning it. And um, let me just quickly tell you about what they are. So, so the first piece about creativity is like, what I will say are overcoming blocks. And so before we can even think creatively, so from a neurological standpoint, what's happening in your brain when you're in a state of creative flow, which from a neuroscience standpoint, creative flow is the brain state when you are doing something creative. To be in a state of creative flow, you cannot be stressed. So if your body is in an amygdala hijack or a stress response, your body goes, your brain actually neurologically cannot think creatively. And so it's really important this first step to think about emotional regulation, self-awareness, um, surfacing your own self-limiting beliefs or fears that, in, that trigger your stress response and prevent you from thinking creatively. So the very first thing is overcoming that at an individual level, which is why the coaching is so important. The second piece, I will say like, this is just about create the flow itself as a state and this concept of being present. And there's so many different words that are being used, you know, whether you're using mindfulness or being present or grounded, or being in a creative state. But this notion of like promoting how to be in a state of creative flow and knowing what that looks like, it's really easy to be in that state as an individual, whether you're snowboarding or making some art. But when you get people in a room, it's really hard to be in a state of collective flow because so often we're triggering each other, each other's stress responses. And so this notion of collective creative flow is really hard to actually do. Um, but that's something that I like to teach my clients is possible, even though it is hard and to at least know what that looks like. Um, and then the third thing is creative practices. So this is the part that most tech companies think they have down on lock and they usually do. It's using design thinking approaches. It's using um, it, it's using visual thinking as a way of promoting more creative approaches. It's using games, it's using um, gamification and just different methods of engaging folks that are playful. And so that's what most people think of in the organizational world when they think of creativity is that last step, that third step. And yes, that's important. And so much of the work that I do is in that space. But if you're not understanding how to overcome your creative blocks and what creative flow looks like, you can't really fully maximize the possibility 
in creative processes and approaches because the other two are prerequisites to that. So those are the three ways I'm kind of exploring and teaching creativity. Thank you for your question. Does that answer it? Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm actually, well, I'm speaking here next week. And when I say some similar things, I just want to say I've been studying it for <laughs> quite a mm -hmm. while too. And um, yeah, everything you're saying is right on. And I would, maybe we could have a conversation. I would love that. Thank I would you. love that. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Making connections, all about. <laughs> uh, just a couple questions, maybe the last two here. So we'll go with Eric. Eric, no. Hey, um, I'm not very knowledgeable on business to business, but I just wanted to ask this question. So like uh, the CTOs, like you said, are like very busy. Are, do you find like uh, other people, other positions, like um, more like not, I don't know how to phrase it, uh, uh, like helpful as well? Like are there certain like, like lower, lower level p positions that you can get in contact with or that, that in your experience have helped as well for business development? I don't, you know, I don't know, I don't know much about it, but I was just curious. Yeah. Well, to be a hundred percent honest with you, Eric, most of the work that I've done since starting my practice has been at um, smaller organizations, um, even at, at, with a nonprofit and um, with teams that with people that know me. So, you know, when you start a business, I haven't been able to reach my target, like CTO, CEO, grouping yet um and so most of the work that i've done has been with smaller teams and smaller organizations just as a way of kind of proving my approach and yeah. getting better so so i haven't actually done very well at reaching that that target market yet i only very recently figured out who they are and i'm still very much in a phase of conducting research around how to better reach those folks because that's something I haven't been able to really succeed at yet. So, so to answer your question, yes, absolutely. Um, that's most of my work has been with smaller teams and organizations so far. Okay, cool. Yeah, I was just curious. Great. And last question by Adam. Hey, uh, real quick. I was just curious. You really sound, uh, when you and Sheila were talking, you totally just were on it. You knew all your stuff. You had all this background, this deep research. How, how do you simplify that message when you go and talk to people? Because I, I wonder if, um, you know, it's, it's always that dance, right, of how do you articulate your, your level of expertise, but then sum it up real quick into distinct points that leave them with trust and confidence that you're the person they want to go with. Oh, Adam, I mean, I, I, I haven't done a very good job of that. Like I actually, you know, talking to you today is really nice because I had a chance to actually ground myself and to think about what I wanted to share with you, but it's hard. Like when I, almost like the whole first year of me starting this business, I can't tell you the number of times I would talk to people their eyes would glaze over. <laughs> So it's a, it's an, it's an, it's a real struggle. And, um, I don't know that I can really say I figured that out. Like I will say that what I've spoken to you about today is the result of me doing this work and working really hard to try and distill this message, really complex message down into just regular English. Um, but I don't think that, I, I think I could do a lot better at that. And, and I don't think, I don't think I'm winning at that yet. So that's something I, I need to get better at. I'm just going to be completely 100% honest. And yeah, it's hard. Can I throw one more question out? Please. Um, and so you may have discussed this. I'm sorry, I had to step away for just a moment. Um, but one thing did you talk about how you're quantifying your progress and your results with these groups? And, and if not one, have you, I'm curious, have you, I'm, did I miss it? If, if you did talk about it? Yeah, I did speak to it um, a little bit through a creativity lens um, with Sheila 
Um, yes. Um, did so, you catch that part? Yes, but not, not outside of that part, right? Okay, yeah, not outside okay, of that cool. part. Okay, um, cool. So to kind of add to that, uh, I've worked, one of my last jobs was, mm -hmm. uh, was really to build relationships among the CEO class of people in the Seattle Bellevue area. And, and then what so, class of people? I'm sorry. Yeah, like the CEO, the executive class okay. of people. Okay. So um, I was just part of an organization uh, where I was helping sort of curate their legacy um, to in a philanthropic way. And so mm -hmm. one thing that I learned really early on is how responsive, because time, when you're like, I never appreciated the value of time until I spent time with these people. And their schedules are so insane. Like I, I have thought that I have been so busy. How could anyone possibly be busier than I am? Uh, it's possible, you know, it's always possible. And it's, it's these people and what I've found to them and I actually had to spend a lot of time in getting into my role, specifically studying how to most effectively manage these high level relationships. And they had, they were, what I found, one of the things I found is they are highly responsive to qu anything that can be quantified, mm -hmm. anything that you can apply a metric to, like that is something that they're like, okay, now you have my attention, like show me how I can move the dial. And so I also worked for this and people who have probably heard me talk about this before, I, I used to work for a nonprofit where I was hired to build the the logistics um for like this uh summer camp for like 40 kids who came from chicago and they like went all and so like it's kind of a big thing that never undertaken anything like that before and so uh what part of that was i worked with it was connected to outward bound as a national organization and we they have sort of these self-assessment surveys that you just sort of um where you ask participants who are gonna participate in experiential learning activities throughout where boundary, you go out into nature, you're sort of put in an uncomfortable situation. You kind of do a self-assessment of how do I assess myself on, you know, public speaking, on confidence, like whatever, there's like a list of 30 things. And we sort of frame, frame it in a way that extracts the data you wanna extract. And then you have them take the same self-assessment afterward Mm -hmm. And then that, that was just a way for us to sort of like through all the different categories of things show donors. Then we had something to finally include in our paperwork to give to donors who, you know, we're seeking fundraising for. I just don't know if that's something you've considered in it, but um, you seem like someone who would love, who loves numbers and that might be something you're already doing. Yeah. Yeah, no, really good thoughts. And I do have a survey that I give my clients before and after that goes into, into more details around the individual team and organizational measures, both before and after, um, and that those are self-assessed, right? So, so yes, I'm doing that, but I have to say that like <sighs> measuring organizational behavior and organizational change is notoriously challenging. It's notoriously difficult to um, to imply causation rather than correlation um and so when you know when you were talking about executives and how they love numbers like <laughs> it's true it's true they want you they want to see you move the needle and so when i talk to execs or you know clients that are, are leading teams i really talk a lot about how the work that we do does impact their own existing measures in terms of employee engagement employee retention, performance and productivity, especially around long-term strategic goals. And so it's a case of like reducing waste and moving you forward. However, the way that it works is very much like, it's long-term work, right? And this is where I have to be really clear about not over-promising what I can help you do. Like I can give you a snapshot before we work together and after we work together with this survey and you'll be self-assessing. It is pretty subjective. It's pretty subjective and it's open to interpretation. Everybody has slightly different things in their mind when they answer the survey. 
um, and I'm speaking, I'm speaking very candidly with you right now about the inherent challenges with self-assessment. Um, so I do like to, as part of my engagement, like, you know, part of the discovery is what existing measures do you have in place? Like, how can I leverage your existing metrics so that we can, in addition to the survey, take a baseline before and after and something that you can continue to keep an eye on based off of whatever actions we're putting in place to observe how that date that changes over time. But as I'm just going to tell you, like, it's not on me to, it's not on me to do that. And one of the things I tell my clients is that I'm here to guide you, but you do the work. Like you have to do the work. You have to own accountability to those performance measures. And I can, I can show you what to do and I can help you get there. But ultimately you have to, you have to do the walking. You have to take the steps and, and do that journey. And it's you who's responsible for the metrics. Because so often executives want to, they want to um, shift responsibility to other. <laughs> and again, I'm speaking very openly with you because I, um, this is a challenge, is getting executives to be accountable to themselves just as much as to the people who work for them, so. And I'm, yeah, I'm thinking also on from the lens of your marketability, you said you are still strategizing your entrance into the CEO, like the chief executive class of people. And so I was thinking through that lens of how you can market yourself and your, and how you can position yourself as you approach those people, um, you know, from an action, there's this, anyway, I have so many ideas about, just the strategy, because I also did political messaging for consulting at a federal level. And so like, my mind goes right to just like, how do you concisely organize the message in front of the eyes who need to see it? Yeah. Um, and that, that's, so that's really, I, I agree with you. Everything you said, totally agree. Um, I'm just thinking of like, how do you increase your customer base? How do you, how do you um, effectively market yourself to the people who can let you scale? You know? Yeah, yeah. It's exciting. Thank you. Thanks. I really appreciate that. Yeah, I, I can. This is such an engaging conversation. I feel like we could all <laughs> keep talking about this for, for hours, but I want to be mindful of our time here because we do want to give space to go into breakout rooms later so that we can have more, uh, you know, intimate conversations with, with each other. I see that there are a couple hand raised here. So hopefully you get a chance to connect with Jyoti afterwards. Um, but uh, just a fun little thing. I wonder if anybody can uh, do it. We're going to take a little screenshot here for, for our social media, if that's okay with you. So if you're comfortable, maybe uh, uh, kind of open up your video. And if you have a copy, coffee cup or something nearby, uh, maybe you could uh, just pose. And Leif, I think, will be taking a picture um and so we could use this for for our content here really appreciate it <laughs> three two one everyone here and smile thank you everybody <laughs> great kind of smiling. cool really awesome conversation Jyoti. i think it's you doing such needed work that so many people don't really know they need. And it's like that really balance of like, how do you kind of put yourself in that position where, you know, they can see the benefit of it. I could, I could definitely talk to you about that too. We're doing somewhat similar work in that space. So um, uh, let's, let's do these breakout rooms. So if anybody hasn't done this before, uh, Zoom gives us this cool feature where it can uh, kind of create these like separate rooms that'll just automatically assign people to and then that way you could you know have more more personal conversations with each people um, uh, and then from there you could you know decide how long you want to stay and chat or, or you know move on to other things if, if you have other things going on so I think we're going to go with like about three to four participants per room does that sound about right um, and, uh, yeah, so I guess we're going to go with that. Thank you again. Thank you so much for having me and I'd love to stay in touch. You're all invited to my circle on Thursdays. So thanks for having me out. Awesome.
And we're going to go into our runes. Go ahead and hit the button and see you there. Did you get one, Jyoti? Oh, is this, are we in this room here? Oh, I did get one, inviting me to break up room one. Okay, I'll join, I'll join. Cool. What up? Wait, Greg, you're muted. Oh, I was gonna say, I gotta bounce and my guy left now ready anyway, so. <laughs> okay, <laughs> cool. See ya. Bye.